gunshot wound, are you saying that you should actually virtually pull it through with a piece of gauze or something like that? If you're isolated and on your own, and there's no uh, prospect of medical treatment for the next seven days, and you've got a gunshot wound under those conditions, and you're forced to go to ground and, uh, and, and hide, then yes, if you can, you must get the junk out um, by any means possible. Uh, it doesn't matter what size the hole is, as long as there's oxygen circulating in the hole. Providing, of course, you know, the bleeding has stopped. Um, Pray uh, God the bleeding in the Falklands will never start again. It was there that most of these young men first encountered the shocking reality of war. And there's nobody around. So too did Surgeon Commander Rick Jolly, who tended 750 wounded, mostly Royal Marines and Paras, without a single death. He lectures now to men pensive at the price that others paid. Um, this is a guy injured at Ajax Bay, and a piece of shrapnel has come uh, past his leg and taken away quite a lot of the, of the flesh and skin. Uh, some five days later, looking at this wound, it has an unusual appearance to it. It's, it's sort of redder than real life, and that's because healing has begun. This is what they call granulation tissue, tissue. This is Mother Nature's attempts to heal, and he's doing extremely well indeed. It's a nice, fresh wound, which the surgeon just scrapes up slightly, and then taking a uh, graft of skin from the other side of, 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 of the other leg begins to cover up the wound. And look how nice it's looking now. Another aspect, and it's an important one, which nobody ever thinks about in exercise, is burying your dead. Okay? How often, when we've been in a commando unit or in a company attack, you get up and you storm through the objective and it's ho-hum, one day to index. Um, it's all been tactics and um, roll on the weekend and a few pints. Okay? It's different in war because you actually end up with the dead. Back at Ajax Bay, these are the dead from Goose Green. We stripped every one of those dead to make sure that we knew what they died of because some of them were going to go back to England and the coroner would be involved. Heartbreaking task, if you like, to, to stand there in the freezing cold and, and strip bodies and take blood-stained things and put them in bags and sign for them, um, rings and, and, and fountain pens and photographs to send back to the relatives, but very important because it also works out your own grief. Anyone who says that brave men don't cry or it's, it's not a feature of a man to cry at war, absolute nonsense. If you feel like crying, you do it, okay? because otherwise you're going to bottle it up and it's going to be twisted. And here are the guys in this mass grave, which was very important to all us around, because we felt that this was a dignified and honourable burial, okay, and, and that we'd done the right thing for these brave men. Much learned in the Falklands is used in the education of the mountain and arctic warfare carter, men training to fight behind the lines. A year ago, the role was reversed to our secondary role, which became our prime role, and that was working as a brigade recce organisation. This, of course, meant that we would be working behind the enemy lines, up to 200, 300k behind enemy lines. This makes us more prone than any other troops in the Royal Marines to capture, including the SBS. So it's my aim over the next 40 minutes or so to give you an introduction into the art of escape and evasion. Many of the postgraduate Houdini tactics taught here are top secret. Their significance is not. The escape and evasion side, obviously, you've got to um, be able to look after yourself. There's different, you've got to be able to keep clean, you've got to know the rules um, to keep clean. And it does, um, although people you probably saw on the survival thing will get hold of um, civilian clothes and things like that, well, that's exactly what you would have to do. Let's take, for instance, in the, in the Falklands, it, um, because most of the people there, the local population, um, spoke English and, and it would be very easy to pass yourself off as, as a farmer or anything like that and actually wander up or very close by um, to the enemy positions obviously without and some it, you just have to um, act completely dumb um, and try and get away with it obviously you try and keep away and not do that because the thing is then if you get caught in civilian clothes and you, it's a different kettle of fish altogether and all these set drills that they're given now that gives them confidence um, for when they do go out on their own, that later on, if they ever do get in a situation for real, um, that they don't feel so alone. Because it does go through your mind quite a lot, what's going to happen to me um, if I do get caught? 
Since not getting caught wins more marks than escaping, a huge premium in training is placed on acute observation. These men are engaged in an A-level version of Kim's game, identifying in this landscape 12 items that the average rambler would probably never notice. You can join in yourself, but it isn't easy, even with a zoom lens to point you in the right direction. One axe, common or garden. The Marines have got 11 more to go. For you, just one. One of those contraptions for pinning recalcitrant children to the roofs of cars. Life out here is full of surprises. Practically every piece of vegetation appears to be liable for income tax. These are snipers training for their lonely, dangerous job. For obvious reasons, their faces will not be seen. A commander could use a, a sniper and a reconnaissance role because they're highly trained in reconnaissance and various aspects of it um, on the internal security side, not only on conventional warfare like we the type of country we're in now. It could be used in an urban sort of guerrilla situation. The professionalism of these men can be blood chilling. Um, if you want them to put down Harrison fire, he can uh, deliberately um, aim to wound a man so that it takes anything up to five to ten men, depending on the terrain, to get him out so effectively by shooting one man. And if you know that the people you're shooting at are concerned about leaving wounded men around, then they'll take up the ten men to get them out of a particular terrain. If you want them to kill somebody, for instance, if you want them to hit any high-ranking officers or commanders on the ground, the task has got to be so that the man warrants being shot in the head. So, you know, so to go in close for a headshot when you can actually shoot somebody at um, maybe 500 metres is uh, a waste of a sniper if he happens to get caught out. So the task to go in and shoot somebody at close range of the head for a headshot would have to be somebody quite high ranking. This is a headshot from 200 metres. And this is the same exercise from 600 metres. But if you look here, you can see uh, the exit holes all right, are quite big. So you can see that the four shots that he fired into the body and the range he fired at was approximately um, 600 metres. So the first shot was on and he was slightly left. And uh, then he, his next shot, he zeroed into the centre of body. And you can see here the centre of the, the dummy's head. And that was his four shots were on. And we were quite happy with that. I found in, in talking among some of you um, a very hardened attitude towards death, uh, to the point of callousness. I'm not thinking about battle here now. I'm thinking about one shot I had where there was a colleague who had died. And it was seen without sentiment. Do you think you become hardened people? Yes, mm, probably. Yeah. Does that disturb you? No, I think it's an advantage. It's a fact of life, I suppose, I think. I mean, there's no... Uh... As you said, it's probably an advantage to be able to, you know, accept it and still carry on. 
Could you accept that or have the same attitude about, say, a member of your family dying? Not necessarily very close, but a member of your family. Would you be more prepared for that than the rest of us? Definitely. Mm. I mean, it's, it's, it's probably happened since I've been in, in the Corps. You, uh, it's, it's, it's something that carries on from the people you work with. Probably the people you work with uh, are as close as family anyway. When family die, it's, you've, it's not such a big deal as it used to be before you joined up. And you think you've been hardened to that by your training? Not only training, but probably experiences as well. I mean, it's, it's just becomes part of the job. And uh, hopefully, you know, you can just uh, carry on. And, I mean, it, you know, every time, if you came across a dead body every time and uh, you broke down or went to pieces, you know, like, it wouldn't be too good, really, for, you know, it's not a great morale booster to suddenly break down in front of everybody. And so... Hopefully, you know, you can just uh, get through it and carry on. If you have an enemy in your science, I mean, is there any hesitation about pulling the trigger? Well, there can't be, can there, really? I mean, there hasn't. There mustn't be. Because basically, and it comes down to it, it's probably you or him. And hopefully it's him each time, so you can't hesitate, really. What do you think this has done to you as, as men? I mean, we're talking about going later into civilian life. Can you ever get rid of that attitude, or will you take it with you to your own graves? I don't think it's something that uh, you want to be particularly ashamed of. Uh, if you consider a death as being something that... Uh, a death, admittedly, is a very sad affair, and I don't decry that at all. But if you take death very badly and you become very emotional about it, uh, that's no way to carry on life. People die all the time. You've got to carry on with life as it comes. And I think it can only be an advantage to realise that. What we're really saying is that you are trained killers in the defence of your country. That's a very dramatic way of putting it. But is it correct? I think, it's, yes, yes. If you're, you're saying that as a right question, yes, it is. But uh, I don't think anyone actually physically thinks, you know, he wakes up in the morning and says, you know, let's go out and kill someone. You have to do it as part of your job, and uh, if you hesitate, if it is part of your job, then you're not fulfilling your role as a good soldier. And you will not be a good soldier, and as, not, as you won't be a good soldier, you'll probably end up dead yourself. That's what it boils down to. To minimise that risk, camouflage and concealment are as vital as marksmanship. In this exercise, they're given two minutes to scatter, blend into the landscape, yet still establish a vantage point from which to fire two blanks at their examiners from a range of 200 metres. Observe now. Cheers, Bob. The observer's role is simply to spot the snipers. Yeah, the rules are unconditional. Exposing a square inch of anything, uniform, skin or rifle, means failure. Uh, Roger. Where Tony is now is about 190 metres, all right? There are 13 men out there somewhere. Just follow that path down that you've just taken up there, Paul. Down to fire shot. Although the gun smoke exposes the sniper's whereabouts, the observers have positively to see him. If they still can't, they call up a marker, a sort of human gun dog, to close in and place a hand directly on the sniper's head. Hand on head. You may think this must be the ultimate giveaway, but no. To pass, the sniper must remain invisible to the observers. Roger, I can't see nothing. Uh, you reckon he can see me? Yeah, he's got you dead to right, I think, John. He is learning a lesson of life and death. No, it's a good position there. What's his name? Call the decks, pass. Any more snipers about? Go back to your right again and step back two paces. I'd say I'm about 180 metres to 200 metres away here, which is just right. I can just about see the observers, although it's a bit misty. Sounds like the power's just running by. 
Somebody's just been pinged. Craig. Craig. Uh, Corporal Craig, Tony. Where uh, did you get that? Yeah, what you can see, all right, you've created a big black hole here by putting yourself in there. All right, if you look behind you, you've got a lot of shadow. It right out here now, you'd have been a lot better in there, into the shadow. But what you've got is you've got a big green bush, and then you've got brown here in the middle. Yeah? So you've got to really think about your surrounding area. Okay? Blending with that bit there, you see? Yeah, well, ideally, you want to be forward of it then, so that that's your background. Okay? Okay, if you stand up then and just move over to the uh, left hand side there. Okay, any more snipers about? At the moment, I've got a, a shot just over the right shoulder of uh, young George, who's about five metres in front of me. He's about to fire his shot. There he goes. This is a dodgy time for me because they're looking straight at me as, as well as him. So I'll keep very still. Down to fire. Okay, not too bad. Not too much smoke. Don't worry about that, you won't give me away to your smoke, right? No, I can't see nothing, Tony. I'm going down, 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 down. And on sniper's head now. Okay, can you make a move then, Tony, please? He's moving his hand up and down. Yeah, OK, that's good enough. OK, Tone. Uh, what's your name, please? Lieutenant Smith. Uh, that's Lieutenant Smith past, Tony. Oh, stand that. Hey! Stand easy, listen in. What kept most people away yesterday was straight edges on your hat, putting the shutter. Darker than the area you're working in, because it's all laid fracking. The main criticism of this fine body of Royal Marines and the subsequent debriefing was that some of them looked too smart. What was it that gave them away? Okay, so I'm off here, same here. Straight edges. All right, that's what give you away. Most people yesterday get caught out. Same again, straight edges. All right. Don't get your weapons now. And uh, in the wagon, by five to nine, everybody's seated, ready to go. Anybody got any problems before we set off from camp? For their next devious operation, they're required to stalk one mile along a riverbed to positions from which they could assassinate their instructors without a lot of fuss. Come five o'clock at the house, you've got that gap with prominent green, light green. Seen. Yeah, I think, I think they're using that as a, as a gateway across. Roger. There's a bit of a dead ground there as well. Yeah, I, they're not using the dead ground, they're actually just crawling. And also by the back of them trees, they're moving up in them trees, I'm sure they are. To some, the assassination proposition is becoming increasingly appealing. Though the problem this time is that they don't know where the observers are. They could actually stumble over them. There seems to be a group yeah. breaking away to the right, look. This is another exercise which carries a large number of brownie points. To fail at this is to jeopardise one's whole future with the Carter. And Russ Craig hasn't excelled so far. Right, go left. Left. Determined to pass this one because I failed at everything this morning and yesterday. All I can and concealment, so I'll, this is the only chance I've got to redeem myself. Now this is looking good. Nice stream. Yeah, I think there's someone just... Me, just... Yeah, that's it. That's got rail on to it. OK, I'll just walk around, Johnny, because it's all dead swampy here, OK? Still you are, still you are, still you are. I don't move, you haven't got you. Ostensibly, Craig has every reason to reckon he could out-ambush Baden Park. He's within 40 metres of his prospective victims and quite undetected.
What's his name? Cobble Craig, right. Tell him to stand up. He's failed. He's failed not because he was seen, but because he's taken an unnecessary risk in getting too close to his target. Craig is so knocked by this that he blazes off his second shot at the passing fish. How many more have we got, Matt? One. One to go. Yeah. What time have we got left, Tony? Five minutes. Five minutes. Roger. Let's have a quick scan then. Now I'm going to ease my rifle into a firing position. I've got a good view of them. I've got a nice backdrop. I hopefully should get away with this. Nice and steady. Okay, sir. Right okay. Right. Just make your way around the back and back up the transport. Now, I think you all agree that the aim was to get you through uh, all your little bits and pieces, like judging distance, observation, cam concealment, and the final aim was going to be getting you through a stalk. Now, we got nearly 50% off you through the stalk. So over a period of two days, that wasn't bad. Cobble Craig screwed it up, all right? He done well, he got it within the 40 metres. In fact, he scared the shit out of me, <laughs> all right? That was good, getting up the 40 metres. You were too close, because you've got to think of an escape route. I thought you were going to do a bayonet charge and throw a rock at me, all right? So what you should have done was retreat it to a safe distance. Remember, you, all you had to do was to get anywhere within 200 metres. And why shoot somebody at 40 metres when you can shoot them safely at 200 metres? I think if you'd have fired, what you'd have probably done if you'd have missed, is get up and run like the clappers. Fine, all right, so point taken. And you screwed it up by losing your temper and firing a shot in the river, all right? Don't do that again. Point taken. We need to tell you anymore. NCO, we shouldn't do that. Well, what, what it was, you see, I was doing the, the camouflage concealment and I kept getting pinged. And I couldn't understand why. And he's using the same same old excuse. Um, oh, they nicknamed me the Pink Crash Helmet because I'm receding airline. No, I mean, fair enough, but I couldn't understand why I kept getting pinged because I was digging out blind. And everyone else around me wasn't getting seen, and I was, and I just couldn't understand it. It was starting to get to me after a while. And then when we'd done that final stalk up from uh, Cadover Bridge, I went the muckiest, the muddiest, the most horrible route, and the most difficult route I could find to really dig out blind and prove that I could do something. I know I did, I ended up getting so close, I'd been better off using a bayonet on them because I got that close and consequently I'd run out of time anyway and that's uh, when I, I fired my shot off, obviously I'd failed because I was only about bloody, I don't know, 22 metres away or something you paced out, 22 paces or something and that's why when I uh, was walking away I had a bit of a bit of a bazzy on, lost my temper a bit anyway, I got in trouble for that anyway uh, discipline problem, I've already had my wrist slapped for that but got about it now. Mm. It was just taken the wrong way at the time. And that's life. The way it's going, Corporal Craig's ambitions appear to be scattering on the winds. However, there are always fresh challenges. Abseiling down into trees is not a recommended sport, if for no other reason than that it's governed by one infallible rule. If a sudden emergency threatens the helicopter, then the rope is cut, even in training.
Another skill to be learned is the accurate cooling down of artillery fire. Hello, Golf 1-1, this is 2-3 Bravo, fire mission over. Golf 1-1, fire mission, over. 2-3 Bravo, grid 451-809, direction 3-350, enemy patrol in building, neutralise now for two minutes. Over. Golf 3-1, grid 451-809, direction 3-350. Two three Bravo. Hello, Golf One One. Golf Three One. This is Two Three Bravo on target. Out. Stop. We're going to split. Come on, stand up. Up. Help him. Help him up. He can't get up. Okay. Help him to his feet. You want to keep your eyes tight. Do not resist. Stand up. Okay. Moving forward. Get those arm locks on. Get them up. Stop resisting. Okay, back down. You want some more play? Okay, you don't have to put him to the ground if you're giving him over He's only a small lad. Get those arm locks on. Get hold of him. Control the head. Up, 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 up. There are some acts of evasion which make sheer common sense. Okay, that was a better one. I did put him on the ground. And the viewer should remember that there are certain aspects of the training of a special forces fighter which are strictly not for domestic application. Looking at the throw, then we can attack it from two points. We can be hitting it down if we get the opportunity, or hit it up. We've got the Adam's apple. We've also got all the breathing apparatus around here. If you smash that in there, you're going to have problems. Go down. Oh, lay on your back, lay on your back. Um, you may have knocked him out, blown him to the ground for a split second, but you want to finish him out. You've got no great weapons instead of just kicking him to the side or whatever. A good heel straight into the side of the can really do the job. OK, stand up. Anybody got any particular points they want to bring out about this area here? No? <laughs> well, it's similar, similar to the mouth I talked about earlier on. It's not only the pain that it inflicts, it will also be the fear. Coming along, Mark, if you've got hold of somebody here, you say, move! He wants to move, because he wants to go everywhere his balls go. <laughs> <laughs> Unarmed combat, the weapon of the silent attack. And that's what you'll be seeing in next week's programme during a night assault on a radar station. It involves a climb that would probably make Chris Bonington think twice. <laughs>